welcome to An Atheist Asks. My name is Christy, and today I'm going to be discussing what is deconversion research. In this video, I'm going to be discussing what is deconversion, what is my research agenda, and how it basically has gone since uh, it started and where I'm planning on taking it in the future. What I'd like to do in this video is discuss the background of what is deconversion research, what have I found so far far in terms of other publications, how I got started in it, how I got started with my deconversion uh, research agenda, and then also where I'd like to take it in the future. In the next video, what I'm... In the next video, what I'd like to do is talk a bit more about who I think could benefit from the research, questioning theists, people who like watching stuff on YouTube, and in particular the role of YouTube atheist content creators and the important role that I see them play. What is deconversion research? I'm using the term deconversion to specifically refer to the process by which theists go into atheism, but that is my application of the term. The term itself can be a bit broader, but it seemed the most appropriate word or phrase to use, and until I get a better suggestion, I'm calling it deconversion research. In terms of the background of the, the research itself and this, this question and topic, um, to since I started the, my my research and my investigation, I have been looking into published academic publications on atheism, uh, on deconversion, and on how people go from faith into atheism. It's really not too much out there. Um, most of the studies that do exist are kind of dated. They tend to be quantitative, and they tend to be psychological tests. So they're generally personality tests, and how atheists differ on personality tests from you know, the rest of the population, or do they, these kinds of things. But um, I've not really found any published research that is asking the question in the way that I am, which is how specifically do people who were once theists become atheists? What is the process by which that happens? If you happen to know some of that, um, if you know a publication, that would be fantastic. I have found one qualitative piece of research done I think, in Colorado um, sometime after 2010, it might have been 2011, and the person interviewed members of an atheist group, which is great, you know, there's, it's good always to have more research out there, but people who are in an, an atheist group and are out and identified as atheists obviously aren't the typical of all atheists, not that you know, any one person could be typical of all atheists, but there's a lot of things that those people would self-select to be activists, they would self-select to do you know, this kind of stuff. So in terms of access to data, there isn't a lot out there, so I really think that uh, this research can fill a massive gap in our understanding because most of the research on religion is done about faith from the perspective of theists. And I am not aware of any atheists who are doing research into deconversion from the perspective of a former believer who is now an atheist. And that's kind of what I think my unique uh, approach to this question is. So why am I doing this and spending my volunteer time uh, watching videos on YouTube and doing research and making videos about it? Well, um, okay, so personal stuff here. As an American, um, I, even though I don't live in the U.S. currently, you know, I've lived there for 30 years, and I have to say I'm really concerned about the quality or the lack of quality of critical thinking generally in the U.S. Obviously any particular individual might be very good at critical thought, but generally I am worried about the the level of ignorance and the tolerance of ignorance and the anti-intellectualism and the anti-scientism that I see having a very active discourse. And I, I don't see a counter to that from the, instead of the conversion side, the deconversion side. Um, and so that's why I want to bring this research out there to humanize the face of people who are doing this kind of, um, who are going through these processes, people who are former Christians, predominantly in, in the first wave of this research. And and to have their voices stand up and speak out for education, speak out for the importance of science and that stuff. So I won't get too much on a, on a hobby horse here, but 
I do think, and I, I haven't been able to establish this empirically, but we have seen in the U.S. a rise in the level of secularism, especially since the 1990s, if I'm remembering the graphs off the top of my head correctly. And as I said, I can't prove this, but I do think this is tied to the internet and the fact that people could get access to information um, that was outside of maybe the, the world book encyclopedia that they had around their house or whatever sort of, you know, the library where they had to, you know, go and, and find a book. They could literally just type questions into the computer and increasingly better and better answers were coming back. And this is where uh, the future is on the internet, I think, and because uh, people who are questioning theists, you know, there's not like there's an atheist group in every community. So we do become connected to the internet and we make friends across the internet and we find mentors and confidants across the internet, at least, you know, from a perspective of a questioning theist who is reaching out for people who are more like him or her. And so I, I think that uh, contributing to our understanding of what the deconversion process is empowers us as an atheist community to put out content and provide support for people who are in the process of questioning and are on the road to atheism. In terms of how this research started, I've been using YouTube as an atheist for a very long time to do research and to educate myself on topics. And I think it was the lazy break of August when Congress was gone, because I'm also like into US politics, and so I, I often watch that and keep up with that. But the August recess happened, and I was on YouTube looking for some entertainment one Sunday afternoon or whatever. And I came across um, the video series by Evidence, his deconversion story, which I've discussed and linked in other videos. I was riveted, absolutely riveted by that story. I. Um, I actually cried. There were moments when I teared up in it. And part of it was sympathy from his suffering, and part of it was a recognition, a self-recognition of a process I had not thought a lot about, but that I had gone through. His approach, the evidence approach, is really looking at his particular psychology, so the components in his own life that were the most important. And as a qualitative researcher, I have experience with reading people's stories, not to get depth, but across. So uh, I published something this year in Parliamentary Affairs on people's vote choice stories and what the construction of people's, how this people construct their stories and the things that they talk about in those stories are actually, there's some, a lot of similarities if you get different kinds of voters, even if it's across different parties, people who say are strong party identifiers, whether they're in the case of Britain, Labour, Conservative, or Lib Dem, or whatever else, the stories they tell about their vote choice are very similar because they have made up their minds before the election, so they don't have too much to worry about. And that was how I started to look at other deconversion stories. So after the evidence video, I wanted to see more, and I Googled, or you know, I Googled, but you know, I, I typed in deconversion from you know, Christianity to atheist or some combination, and started watching deconversion stories. And after, I don't know how many, it was probably getting on 10 or 20 or 15, I'd gotten to the point where I was starting to recognize elements of people's stories. And I think it was at, I mean, for the first, you know, 10 or 15 videos, it was purely entertainment. I was just interested in the human experience and the human expressions, things that they were discussing. But after a while, as I watched more and more, I started to see people saying the same things. One of the first things I noticed was how almost every single story of someone deconverting away from religion to atheism includes them saying, it just didn't make sense to me, or I couldn't make it make sense. It is almost universal that that phrase will come out. Even in my own story, I noticed, you know, it just didn't make sense to me. And seeing, hearing that phrase again and again, I remember as being like a bit of a light bulb moment. So I don't exactly remember, but I, re you know, there are things that stand out in my memory in terms of me making a connection, not just, you know, one person and looking very deeply at their story, but looking at the structures of people's, tens of people's stories. So over the month of August, I collected about 130, um, over 130 now, videos. And those are just the ones that I've selected to study. So I've probably watched about 200 videos in total, or over 200 videos in total, just from what's available on YouTube. And there were, if you, if you do the same thing, uh, if you do a systematic and, um, search for these kinds of deconversion stories, 
I found three waves, is what I'm calling them, three waves of deconversion. The first, uh, uh, well, the first is the deconversion stories. Then there was another wave where people talked about um, like how I became an atheist. So it's instead of the focus on being on the story or deconversion stories, it was more of a like a how-to. The best data come from the deconversion stories because people start at the beginning and they go through. The next best are the how I became an atheist stories. There is also then a lot of um, how to come out as an atheist or why you should come out as an atheist that sometimes include people's own stories, but because of the question, you know, because it's about coming out, the focus tends to be less on how they became an atheist and more about dealing with the consequences of realizing that they were atheists. So as I said, I watched, I'm sure it's over 200 videos in total because I didn't use every video that I watched and I had to watch them. Some are six minutes long, some are an hour and a half long. I, I would generally, you know, watch about 15 to 20 minutes even of the longer videos, just to get a sense of whether or not this would be appropriate for data analysis. So at the moment, there's about 300 in my preliminary data set. And as I decided to collect these stories and I watched them, um, I started to make a note of and identify the themes, the experiences, the values, other things that were continually coming up um, in people's stories that I was seeing again and again and again. And I just, it's called in qualitative research, open coding. You just read through it and you make notes of what you see. Like, I see this, I see that. And then you might go back later, realize there's more in the data because you didn't realize there were things to see because you were just starting out, let's say, or you weren't looking for them at the time because you didn't think about it or didn't realize it. And that's um, kind of what I did for that first wave of watching and screening and then identifying 130 stories that were going to form my data set. And a lot of the things that I've discussed in my videos in terms of people's values or the kinds, the range of ages, all of that information comes from that initial open coding data analysis phase. The next phase is from going very, very broad and collecting as much data as I could find to going very, very narrow. And that's because it's easier to say something precise about a very narrow topic than it is to say something precise about a very wide topic. And I decided after I had the 130 um, videos that there, there was just unmanageable and there was no reasonable way I could handle that amount of, of data. Because again, it's not just, well, I didn't say again, but if I want to analyze this, I can do a watch through, but what I really need are the transcripts. And I need to look at the language and do like a hard coding, a systematic coding. And that part comes up later, but to get a little deeper into the data as it as it exists in a way that's easy for me to unpack it, I've decided to create a, a pilot study, which is the next logical phase in, in social research. You don't do a huge study, you start off with a small study, and you run it and you see how it goes, and if it goes well and you get interesting results, then you expand it, and that's where I am now. So the pilot study, I decided that I wanted to look at how these larger themes start to appear in particular stories, and where they appear, where they don't appear, which ones appear the most, which ones seem to be rare, all this kind of stuff. So if I narrow the kinds of people who I want to talk about or investigate, it helps, right? Because if, if, a, if a population is very diverse, you need to have a lot of, you need to have a large number of observations in order to represent the diversity you see in a population. So the narrower and the more homogenous a population becomes, it, you need fewer and fewer observations to actually capture the diversity within that population. What I've done for my pilot study is I've basically just done all the things that I know I have personal familiarity with so that I'm less likely to make mistakes. So I've selected North Americans who speak English and that is and uh, who are Christians who have uh, made videos that report that they have become atheists. So my pilot study is actually very, very, na very narrow. One, it's narrow on geography, I'm trying to limit it. And the reason I say North America is because I think there are Canadians in the sample. The, I know that there are Canadians in, in the wider 130, but I think there might be um, a few Canadians in the pilot sample that I've selected. It's a little bit sometimes an inference. You don't always know where people are located, so you have to listen and try to triangulate their location based on the references that they make, which isn't easy. Uh, 
but there didn't seem any natural reason to exclude Canadians, so I just said North Americans and English speaking. So that obviously like narrows the field even more. Um, I only doing Christian to atheism because again this is a, a very easy way to narrow the kinds of questions. So when I make uh, conclusions about the data, I'll, I'll be able to say nothing about people who are Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or anything else. And that's not my intention. I want to look very, very narrowly at Christians and specifically people who are now atheists who used to be Christians and their process. So again, specific is terrific. The final uh, sampling sort of demographic is ethnicity and in order to you don't have, I mean for a sample like this it's not so important that you have the percentages right as much as you have enough data to analyze so let's say if you have half men and half women you don't have you could actually probably get away with like three men and seven women or seven men and three women as long as you reported that you know the three women were um, there were only three women so that the observations aren't quite as maybe nuanced as the men's but there's nothing unrepresentative about that because again this is qualitative research not quantitative so I have three uh, I believe they're all African Americans I don't think that there are any um, sort of Canadians of African descent in the data set I'm just doing this from memory now but I'm, I'm near positive they're all African Americans in order to get that um, perspective I don't have any Hispanic Americans I think it's maybe because if they're speaking in Spanish I don't speak Spanish so that might be a sampling you know like a selection bias from my side there are um, other like non-European descent non-African descent Americans and um, that might be in the 130 but there aren't sort of enough people for me to feel like I could validly go in and use one person to represent um, the sort of the, the insight to an ethnicity. Because the data set has quite a few African Americans, um, I've heard more than just three stories. So it's not like there's only three African Americans in the data set of 130 and only, and so all three made it into the sample. That's not the case. Um, there's a lot more African Americans in the sample and I've selected men and women from that sample in order to get that representation into the data set. care about this research? Well, in my mind, I think people who are either currently or in the future will be questioning theists should get a lot out of learning about the process that they are experiencing. I think one of the harder things that people go through, theists, questioning theists go through, is that they don't realize they're on a path to atheism. They have no clue until they get there. And so it can be very disorienting. And I think just having, seeing other people go through something similar, even if that person who's watching doesn't end up as an atheist, at least they won't feel so alone. So I think that this deconversion research can really help people who are having moments of crisis and that we can reach out to them and be supportive and let them know that they're not alone. I also think that um, anybody who's interested in how people go from religion into atheism will find this research interesting. And that's within the atheist community or even the theist community. And I have said in my videos that you know I've given religion suggestions for how they can not you know, have so many problems. They won't listen, of course. But at least I'm having a dialogue. And maybe there are some individual theists who will um, you know, appreciate the understanding why people have doubts and can empathize with it even if they don't go that far. So I think just generally anyone who is interested in how people go into atheism from religion would find this, this in interesting. If you're an activist atheist and you are interested in getting secular values, safe and neutral public spaces so that we can all feel welcome if you want to see an emphasis on science and science classrooms and to have a place where religion is something that you practice privately, you don't push on people every time you leave the house, then I think uh, these kind, getting more people who are able to deconvert or open to deconversion or at least understand that there's a process of deconversion that leads to atheism. I think as activists um, we can use this to help people um, get our message out and also normalize atheism. I also think that YouTube content creators are potential benefits of this research if you are interested in using your content to educate people and break 
their uh, bad habits, their faith-based thinking and getting them to think for themselves, then knowing more about how that process works will help you create better content and maybe more targeted content for people who are having, um, who are questioning theists and are, are ripe for the kinds of uh, content that you're creating. And in part two, I'm going to discuss this all a little bit more and try to connect up the findings uh, with my larger goals for this research. So what is next in terms of the research and where I want to take it? And now I'm going to talk about where I'm going to go from between now and March of, of 2015. So my hope is that over the holidays, I'm going to go back and review my notes that I made initially in August and September on deconversion. And I've already identified the 13 individuals that I would like to do more in-depth analysis of and to re review my notes and start the process of doing the pilot study so over the holiday breaks. It's my hope that in February of next year, I'm going to be uploading videos with some of the preliminary findings from the pilot study. So that would be an overview of the general themes and then looking at individual examples or looking at common elements across people's stories from within the pilot study. And I would very much like for the YouTube community to watch and react and give feedback on that. And based on that reaction and that feedback, um, I'm also going to take any suggestions that make sense to me. And I'm hoping by March, um, definitely no later than April. Uh, otherwise, I'm starting to get into the general election, which um, hopefully I'll be studying uh, the UK general election next year. But my aim in March would be to publish a video where I will talk about, uh, after the pilot study, what is the next phase of research and where would I like to take it at that point. So that's basically where my trajectory is for the next, say, six months. Right, so I think I've got a little bit more time before my flight, so I've got to, I can wrap this up by telling you what you can expect in the next video. So in this video, I've discussed most of the, the history and the planning, the academic stuff, the academic side of the deconversion research story. Next time, I want to talk more about how it can impact people. So how this research will identify the intellectual needs of questioning theists, how it could possibly be a resource for people who are going through the process of leaving their faith and coming into atheism. And also, I think that there is a role for not only support videos for people who are going through deconversion, but also for their family members, for their friends who might be really freaked out by the fact that someone that they know has come, in, come out as an atheist. And if that's the case, if we have videos talking uh, specifically for those friends and family explaining what the deconversion process is and this isn't a phase, they are not angry at God, um, the, you know, if, if they would, it's not just about them having more faith. If we can get that kind of support stuff out there, then maybe when people come out, it won't be so difficult on them and their family and their friends. That would be a wonderful thing, I think, that could come out of this research. So, from Amsterdam Airport, I would like to say uh, thank you guys for watching and that uh, this has been an Atheist Asks. I've been Christy and you have been amazing and awesome putting up with all my background noise. So, thanks and I will see you guys next week, Thursday, um, your, my substitute video for a different Atheist Read series which got really complicated. So, um, it's going to be two Thursdays of an Atheist Asks and then probably a double helping of a different Atheist Reads. That seems fair. That's kind of like a nice seasonal gift um, and also I, I'm gonna owe you guys so I'll do that too. Alright, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.